introduce myself first. I'm the MC tonight. My name is Rachel Chen. I'm a teacher from International Journalism Program at UIC, mm -hmm. the United International College. Um, tonight, we're very happy to have our speaker from the same program, whom I'll introduce in a minute. And this is lecture series called One World Under Pandemic. So basically, we have a month actually more than a month now, I think, um, lecture series hosted and uh, being uh, organized by the Division of Humanities and Social Science at UIC. And this week, we are happy to have uh, Jesse. Uh, okay, I'll let, uh, sorry, I'll let our opening uh, speaker, I'll introduce our opening speaker first, Professor Christian Alpaster, a Swasa, professor from Swasa, Social administration, social science and social administration, sorry. Um, I'll let you um, speak for us for a minute or two and then we'll direct the lecture to Jesse if that's okay for all of you. So yeah. Professor Christian Alpaster, please, thank you. Is it working now? Yeah. Um, it's called Asparta, okay. Uh, it should be easy. It's called, it actually means apple tree, so you can call me apple tree, but that's easier. Uh, for Jesse Owen Hearns Brenneman, uh, he's one of my colleagues, is a assistant professor. I will have to say this now first because I start talking about it. He gives a talk about the role of American uh, journalism during the pandemic. First, I thought about this, what's the strong connection there? And then I see the subtitle and the introduction, then everything is very clear. It's uh, lessons not learned and so on, uncertainty and so on. And uh, after reading the introduction, really, I like the idea that you can look at big disasters and figure out the health of social systems. Um, in this case, it's journalism as a social system, the media system, so to speak. And also, the, uh, I like the idea that the pandemic is an opportunity to learn lessons not learned. This is very, very important. I think we had been sleeping for 100 years. It seems like uh, many people got um, kissed awake, so to speak, like, oh, well, you don't have to go to work, for example. You can... There's many companies now, 80% of the workforce stays at home and save all the traffic jam and save all the air pollution, save all the gasoline money and realize hey, it's much cheaper for the company. So things, we might have thought about it, uh, but we didn't think about it in society. So a lot of things, there's really opportunity here as well. And lots of lessons we didn't learn before and uh, about pandemics or, or in general, I think it's time now to learn a lot of lessons. I'm looking forward to hear Jesse's um, take on, on things and the future perhaps as well. I'm looking forward to it. Please, Jesse, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, everybody can hear me, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, go great. On. Great. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for having me here. I've been um, very uh, excited about being invited to participate in this. Um, I've been planning for it so, uh, ever since I, I, I got asked to, to give a talk. Um, so I've been working on this for, for you know, keeping my, my eyes and my ears open just to, you know, in my media consumption to see the, the interesting, the uh, disappointing things that I've noticed in the, in the, the role that American uh, journalism has played in, in covering the pandemic. Um, I thought of other topics such like as, as Chinese media, but I don't speak Chinese and I don't really look at Chinese media, but I do consume a lot of, of American and, and British and Canadian media. So I thought this would be a much better focus on that. Um, yeah, uh, and before I begin and go into details, I just want to kind of give the outline of the scope of what I'm talking about. Um, now a lot of, there's been a lot of criticism against a lot of American journalism, but there, it's more about Fox News and how Fox News is covering uh, the pandemic and uh, Fox News always apologizing for Trump and supporting whatever Trump is doing and things like that. There's other networks and uh, news journalism in the United States that's supporting, that's like being against uh, lock, stat, lockdown and uh, self-quarantine and supporting protests against it, right? Uh, so those, that's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's a whole other issue to talk about, uh, the right wing and conspiracy media, how they're covering it. Um, I'm more interested in covering how mainstream media uh, is covering the pandemic um, because you know, we still have this idea that mainstream media is supposed to be 
very responsible and very neutral uh, and very professional about it when it's just very easy to criticize Fox News for doing something, right? So that's why I thought the uh, focusing on this mainstream center left kind of media would be a, would be a lot more interesting. Um, can you see my video? Yes, yes, because not with you. Not yet. They said they can only see you. Is the slide PPT slide not the video? You need to share they screen they can only and then ping pong the video again. Yeah. Now you, you can see me. Share screen and then ping pong the video. Yes. Okay. Now I'm here. Okay. Hi. Is that better? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. So, like I said, um, you know, I don't. And me personally, I I don't really read Fox News that much. I'll see when people talk about Fox News. But it's not, you know, it's like I said, it's just too easy to criticize Fox News. It's, it's you know, more of a propaganda network for, for Trump than anything. So it's, I just, let's just look at the real journalists, the ones who win prizes and the ones who everybody is, is praising for being uh, proper journalists. Let's look at these organizations and see how they're doing in the pandemic, right? Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we have to really differentiate between the things that, that journalists are doing, the things that journalists can control and the things they can't control, right? Because a lot of the criticism I see for journalism is they go, well, that's not really the journalist's fault. Like that, you know, we have to look at the things that the journalists are actually doing, right? So I wanna kind of separate those things out, right? Um, because we need to think about when we're looking back at this, this crisis from many perspectives, it's from the, the journalistic perspective or social welfare or economics or whatever, right? We need to, look, we, we need to use our foresight. We need to think, well, you know, what do we need to do to prevent this kind of thing in, in the future from getting out of hand, right? It's easy to look back and say, oh, wow, we should have done this and journalists should have done that, right? But we need to see, well, what, we already should have been doing things in a certain way, right? When this whole situation started, we should have been running our society and running our media system and running our health system in such a way to prevent these kinds of global pandemics from destabilizing economies and putting people out of work and killing, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, right? So that's what we want to say is we should have the kind of society and media system and journalism that will help prevent this kind of thing, right? We, it's so easy to go back and say, oh, well, we should have had more masks or tests or something and say, yeah, but why didn't we have that, right? So that, that's the perspective I wanna say, like why, what journalism should already have been doing when this started, right? Uh, the other aspect is you can't, you know, the, the way that the specifics of this virus and the specifics of this pandemic are, are, are very specific, they're very unique. So we have to, you know, the, the way that the, the actual nature of the virus itself, it really affects how we, we journalists can cover it and how journalists can learn about it, right? So we have to think about the, the nature of it, right? Journalists can't control, right? There's long incubation periods and it's highly transmittable and we don't, we kind of still figuring out how it's transmitted and there's many asymptomatic carriers and all these expressions that we didn't know three or four months ago, right? Um, these are phrases and concepts that journalists also have had to learn over the while. And, and even uh, I'll talk about later about medical journalists, right? But even just general journalists and in the, in the general public had to kind of learn all of these concepts. So, you know, it's fair enough to say that, that we didn't understand it very well, right? Because it's a new thing, right? We don't talk about these. This is a new way to talk about a new kind of disease, right? Um, and the scientific information we have is continuing to change and continue, continuing to develop. And the scientists around the world are still discovering new things about it, right? There's reports yesterday in the news, like they, they're testing people who died in November who have the virus in France and in, in different places. And you go, wow, like obviously journalists would have no idea about that. So we can't really criticize them for that kind of an issue, right? Um, and then we have to look at, um, you know, the, the sources of information that journalists get, right? 
I will talk about this in more detail. A lot of them are not very honest, right? Uh, I'll give lots of examples from Trump, and he's obviously lying a lot about this to try and make himself look better. But if that's your source of information, then it's really difficult to, to validate that, right? Um, and maybe you're looking for a medical expert to give you information, but maybe they're not an epidemiologist, they're not a virologist. Maybe they study other kinds of diseases and they don't really know uh, about this topic as well as other sources would. So the journalists can't really control that. They, they can try to find better sources, uh, but in an, you know, in an emerging situation like this, it's not that easy for to suddenly have a whole network of different uh, sources than you're used to having, right? So those are the things that I'm not going to talk about. You know, so I spend five minutes talking about what I'm not going to talk about. Right? Um, yeah, what I am going to talk about is um, the infamous uh, press conferences from the uh, apparently soon to be ending <laughs> coronavirus task force uh, that uh, President Trump and, and, uh, and Pence and all of them are running. Um, I'll give some examples of, of false balance, which is a topic um, I've, I've studied quite a lot and researched um, and, and taught about it. Um, I'll look at the reporting of statistics and some issues with that. Um, and like I mentioned, the basic lack that in the news media of having reporters dedicated to covering medical issues. Um, and then finally, fact-checking disingenuous sources, as I say, which again is examples from Trump and, and Pompeo and people like that, right? Um, so the press conference uh, is become, the press conferences that Trump was running have become like this hallmark in journalistic and, and political history uh, because of just how ubiquitous they were and how much news coverage they got and how many people watched them. Um, but from my angle, it's, it's how the journalists covered these press conferences that is a big issue, right? Um, and not just for me, this many journalists and many scholars and people on Twitter and everywhere kind of criticizing uh, how this went on, right? Um, for example, um, a Professor um, Jay Rosen from New York University, he, he in March, right? So this is already almost two months ago. He said that uh, that journalists shouldn't cover the live the press conferences live anymore. They shouldn't broadcast them live, right? And he wrote this really good hypothetical editor's note, right, saying that editors should this is what editors should tell their journalists, right? We will not we will not cover live any speech rally or press conference involving the president. The risk of passing along bad information is too great. Instead, we will attend carefully to what he says. If we can independently verify and any important news he announces, we will bring that to you after the verification step, right? Um, and this is something that's very important for journalism is you don't just have raw information, you have raw information and then you verify and you fact check it, right? But when the president is giving a press conference, it, the, the automatic reaction is almost just to let's broadcast this live. Uh, because, you know, then this has been a historical thing with Trump for five years, right? Because you never know what he's going to do what crazy thing he's going to say live that will suddenly create lots of news. So, you know, this is not a new thing, right? Um, but anyway, a lot of people were saying that. And, and a couple of days later, Rachel Maddow, again, on her show, advocated that they shouldn't just air the press conference live. Um, s newspapers started to come out and say that they're not going to do it, right? It's the opposite of news, as the St. Louis uh, Dispatch Editorial, uh, Post Dispatch Editorial Board said, uh, because it's full of misinformation. You, you have to think of Trump's record for dishonesty, right? So carrying it live is professionally irresponsible. And, and as we know, last week around it, the after his comments about people drinking bleach and putting sunshine inside their bodies, they decided suddenly to not do the daily briefings anymore. So they kind of imploded on their own. Um, but the whole time, right, all of this misinformation and lies and spin that Trump got out there uh, this would have been avoided if they hadn't covered it live and would have gone there and seen what happened and then reported on it and fact checked it. Right. So this is something I think that people can learn in the future, um, especially about Trump or any any politician is just because a famous, uh, a powerful politician is speaking doesn't mean you have to broadcast it live to the world. Not everybody has to do it. Maybe one network can do that, but the rest should fact check it and, and you know, um, yeah, uh, so I'll give some examples of this, right? Um, 
so NBC News had the, the headline, right? Trump suggests injection of disinfectant to beat coronavirus and clean the lungs. Um, and, and number one, this is irresponsible as a headline because it's a lie and it's, you're giving dangerous information to people. So it's very irresponsible in the first place for them to do this. But again, this is because they're just live tweeting or live blogging on what the president is saying, right? Um, and many American media outlets did that, or they kind of made fun of it, right? Uh, CNN, right, and that analysis piece, right? Trump, ever the salesman, is peddling dangerous cures for coronavirus. They go, okay, right? Um, Donald Trump's Old West traveling medicine show, he's marketed, like, it's, it's a bit too light and a bit too funny considering that, that people actually got harmed from what Trump was saying, right? People have actually hurt themselves trying to use his, his, his magical cure. So it's a bit weird to be so funny, to treat this as, as something that's so funny, right? Um, or New York Times had this, the typical kind of headline they like, right? Uh, President Trump theorized dangerously in the view of some experts about the powers of sunlight um, and household disinfectants, right? And you, you, when I read that headline, I was like, what do you mean some experts? I don't think any experts would say that you should use household disinfectants to kill coronavirus. And even non-experts, just like average people with just common sense would, would, wouldn't think that's a good idea. But if the president and you support him and the president says that, then maybe that would change your mind, right? So it, this kind of false balance, I'll talk a bit about that more later, is, is quite dangerous. But again, that happens when you just report live on everything that Trump is saying. Um, I, I attended this, um, uh, this Zoom web conference from this organization, uh, uh, firstdraftnews.org, which is a very good website with many resources um, for journalists um, and journalist teachers, apparently. Um, and they had very good uh, uh, resources to help journalists learn how to cover um, coronavirus better. Um, and I found this was one of their, their, their pieces of advice, which I thought was really great because a lot of the news that CNN and New York Times and these, you know, like I said, these mainstream organizations were breaking these rules, right? You don't, you lead with the truth and you don't repeat myths, right? And in the examples I gave, they were leading with the myth right? Does drinking bleach cure coronavirus? And then you have to click to find out. And you go, well, that's, that's really ir irresponsible, right? So we, we, you know, we, journalists have to go back and think about this, the best practice for headline writing, right? It, it might be uh, because of the nature of the internet and wanting to get clicks and, you know, you, you tweet something that's a bit catchy and so that people would click on it and go to the website and then you get more ad revenue um, but it's, it's very greedy because you're, maybe people don't click on it and they just see the headline and it can be quite dangerous. Right? So journalists really need to rethink this, this kind of practice, right? Um, and some people are doing it properly, right? Uh, BBC after Trump's comments, BBC, this was their headline was outcry after Trump suggests injecting disinfectant as a treatment. That is the headline they led with debunking the myth, right? Al Jazeera English, even, even, even stronger, right? Experts react with horror, right? Like, that's the news is that he said something so misleading that, you know, uh, that it's dangerous and people are reacting with horror. That is the way that you should kind of frame, uh, frame the story, right? You have to emphasize the dangerousness of, of, of his comments more than just saying, repeating what he said, and then maybe fact checking it later on, right? So that's a, another dangerous aspect of this. Um, Yeah, hello, okay. Yeah, um, another aspect in the, in the uh, press conference that was very widely covered was um, at, least once, at least once every press conference, maybe twice, there would be this argument or this, Trump would get really angry and really upset at a journalist and, and yell at them and call them names. And every time that happened, it was like, I got, you get, you get alerts from it on your phone and Twitter goes crazy talking about what Trump just said to the journalist, right? Um, and there's this article in Business Insider gives examples of many of the cases, right? Um, right, calling a reporter, uh, a terrible reporter for asking what Trump would say to Americans who felt afraid after the virus, right? Um, and, and a PBS NewsHour reporter, she asked a question and uh, he called it a threatening question and told her to be nice. 
right? A lot of these are directed against women, which is something that I'm sure people will be, will be researching a lot later on, um, right? Another CBS reporter asked to clarify a statement from his son-in-law and called her, said she had a nasty tone, right? Uh, there's all these examples, right? The journalist asking questions and, and Trump is just reacting very angrily to it, calling them a fake or a wise guy questions or something like that. And, you know, obviously it's, it's it, this brings up a couple of questions like, okay, Trump is being rude to the journalists, but is, that's not something that people should be surprised about. Um, and you have to, that's what Trump does. Like why are people get all outraged and surprised about it? You say, well, that's what happens. You should expect that, right? If Trump gives a, a, a coherent answer full of facts, then you should be surprised. When he calls you fake news, then that's, you know, Monday afternoon, it's not something special. So that's a bit, a bit weird. Um, so there's a bit too much emphasis on covering all of these conflicts between this, these spats between journalists and Trump. Right? After this would happen, the journalists would go on uh, all the news networks and talk about what the, what the president said to them and make, and make themselves into a news story, right? And that's not helpful for, for educating people about what the government is doing about the pandemic. It's not helpful for uh, saving people's lives and giving them information that they need to know. It's just kind of repeating, you know, reinforcing that Trump is, doesn't like journalists and he doesn't like tough questions. And then you also have to ask, well, would, what would, would, when you ask the question, what do you think Trump is going to say? If you know he's, he's going to lie, or he's going to give some kind of a spin, then, then why do you asking that kind of question in, in the first place? Right? You, you have to ask questions, I, I guess, but if you know he's not going to give you the truth, well, go cover something else. Go do something else. Ask people who know the truth. Ask the doctors on, on Trump's panel. Don't ask Trump any questions. Ask uh, Anthony Fau uh, Dr. Fauci and all the other experts about it instead of the president, because you know he doesn't probably know and he probably wouldn't he'd probably lie about it if it looks bad for him. So, you know, uh, and this is kind of a moot point now because he's canceled the daily briefings, but he's still doing press conferences. Uh, and you have to think why would, you're not gonna get any information from him. All you're gonna get is maybe you, a, a nickname and get yelled at and then that's it. So, you know, that, that's another thing we should think about. Um, returning to this idea of false balance, um, uh, like I said, I've, I've uh, written about this in my, in my books and some articles, and uh, I saw so much of this in, in the coverage that, um, you know, again, it made me think, well, journalists are still kind of relying on this, right? Uh, this notion of that reporting should be he said, she said, right? Um, uh, for example, there's a, a, a very good article from Gay Tuckman from the 70s where she was researching uh, uh, she was doing uh, ethnography in a newsroom, um, and she noticed the, the, the habit of journalists, right? Uh, that, for example, many claims made by sources can't be verified quickly or easily, and government sources are de facto more credible than other kinds of sources, so it's very easy just to get a comment from a politician, right? Um, and if a politician says something, right, if a government official says X, uh, a, a government official says A and X said A is a fact, right? Trump said you should drink bleach. And that's a fact. So you report Trump said you should drink bleach and then experts disagree that you shouldn't drink bleach. And then you have he said, she said, you have a balance, right? Um, and, and like the, some examples I gave before, reporters were still doing this. Um, and this gives the impression that all claims are equally valid and there are no facts in politics. All these, you know, these are many criticisms that academics have had about using this, this false balance over the years. Uh, and they were, and journalists were still doing this again. Um, for example, uh, <laughs> um, New York, uh, this is from a month and a half ago, uh, Trump suggests lack of testing is no longer a problem. Governors disagree. He said, she said. Trump says it's not a problem. Governors disagree. We don't know the answer. We don't know the solution. We're just journalists, right? Like, they should fact check this. They should do more investigation and figure out the truth. Is it a problem? Is it not a problem? But instead, it's just much easier just to give this kind of a, of a headline. Uh, and then you can pump out stories much quicker, right? 
Um, and somebody on Twitter, I, I didn't, I don't have a source for this um, because it was just something people were sharing on Twitter. They went through and edited this and said, this is what the headline should be. Lack of testing is still a problem. Governors, um, governors and experts, right? Governors and experts say testing is a problem. Trump refuses to accept that it is a problem, basically. <clears throat> right? Uh, Trump says he hasn't heard about testing despite facing public questions about testing every day. Right? This is the kind of, of headlines that we should be writing, right? following the, the rules that, that we had before from first draft. Right? Don't repeat the myth. Don't balance a lie with, with the truth right? or with the majority of people are saying this. Right? I and mean, again, this is not a new thing. Journalism has been doing this a lot for, for climate change and um, in, in many issues like that, right? Some people say m climate change is caused by men and other people don't, you know, when obviously the, the, it's not that balanced, right? So this is creating a kind of a false balance, right? Um, another story just, just from a couple of days ago, um, Senator Rand Paul, who had, who had uh, coronavirus, right? Um, said, uh, he said since he already had coronavirus, he could not contract it again or spread it to others. Uh, so that's why he's walking around without a mask and, and, and not doing social distancing. He says, well, I had it, so now I'm immune, right? Claims that experts say are still unproven, right? So he says he's immune, experts say he, we don't know, right? Well, again, you're repeating the myth. He says that you can't contract it to others. And uh, as far as we, you know, this claim is unproven. So we don't know if you can contract it, if you can spread it to others or if he can contract it again. We don't know that because the data is still out and there's not enough information about that yet. So that's what they should lead with, right? Ron Paul may be exposing people and maybe exposing himself to spreading coronavirus. Maybe he's carrying it and spreading it to other people. It's very dangerous, right? This is the, the lead that you should start with, not he says that he's immune because he doesn't know if he's immune, right? He's a, he's a doctor, okay, but he's not, the scientific community does not know if we can get immunity for this. So it's very misleading to balance it like that, right? Um, or just from yesterday, which is kind of a big story now, right? Um, the Wuhan lab at the center of the US-China blame game, what we know and what we don't know, right? So because Pompeo, the Secretary of State, says there's enormous evidence, that is the framing for the, for the story and we're trying to balance it. Well, let's see. He says that it is, other people say that it isn't. That's, you know, it's just, you know, this, it gives people a very false impression about, about what's going on. And again, it doesn't help people really learn more or understand more about it or, or save lives or anything like that, right? Um, now, the next aspect I think is, bugs me every day when I read any news about it. Um, when, the vast majority of time when they're reporting statistics about who's infected and how many people have died, they just say, you know, the virus has now infected more than 1.34 million people, which is from a couple of weeks ago. It's a lot more than that now, right? Um, and they very rarely say confirmed cases. They just say, these are, there are this many cases, there are this many deaths. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about confirmed cases, people who got tested or met some kind of standard. It's not, the ex it's not that number. So they're, they're really misleading people unless you, you have to uh, add adjectives like confirmed cases or suspected cases or it's estimated or something like that, but they don't do it, right? Um, uh, because uh, the, the, the way that different countries and different organizations gather data and how they count exactly who's infected and, right, uh, is it, do deaths at home count, right? There was an article the other day, why is the, the death rate in Belgium so high? Because well, they count people who die in elderly care facilities and other countries don't, right? Some people have a lot of testing, some people have very little testing. Uh, so all of these numbers are really incomparable, but you journalists love to compare data, right? Like an election, how many people voted for which person, right? They love to show this data and make these big charts and things like that, even though it's, it's misleading, right? Uh, so for example, the CDC, um, they're, they're, the American CDC, they're, they say they only report the deaths that have COVID-19 listed on the death certificate. 
So who knows how many deaths they're missing from this total because of their standard. And again, other places, other countries, other medical facilities in different cities or towns around America, around the world, count all of these things in very different ways. So it's, it's very misleading. Um, and our colleague, uh, Professor Johnson, um, already pointed this out a, a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, is it accurate, right? You have the crude death rate, but how do we know about this, right? This is not something that's been, that's been, uh, that we can say with certainty, but journalists like to say it with great certainty. Um, yeah. Um, so for example, CNN, if anybody's watched CNN, they have, they shrunk down the screen now and they always have this little bit in the corner, right? The coronavirus pandemic, right? Um, this is from April 6, right? And they have this little thing in the corner with the, the John Hopkins University, right? Uh, the total cases, the deaths, United States total cases, deaths again. And that's not what those numbers are. These are confirmed cases that the John Hopkins University is kind of gathering from different sources. And it's fairly reliable, but it's not the number of cases or deaths. It's the number of confirmed or reported, right? And they, and they still do it. Even, you know, today there's the same thing and they keep updating and it keeps getting higher and higher. And this is not what those numbers mean, but they still report it as if it's an election or a primary and the numbers are going up and we're adding the number of people who are voting and who's going to win or something like that. Um, and this is a very bad habit that journalists have, um, again, because it gives people a very mistaken impression of, of the situation that's going on. <clears throat> and other people are starting to question this and try to report it in a more dynamic way or more getting a bit more data, right? Um, and again, this is something that journalists are learning more and more, so we, we can't really blame them. Um, so uh, John Byrne Murdoch, who works for Financial Times, right? So this Financial Times, it's a, you know, economic business newspaper. So they need to have uh, people who are good at analyzing big data, right? So, they, so he is going through and looking at different kinds of data to see how to measure this. And if you follow his, his Twitter, it's very interesting. There's new, new charts and new ways of looking at data every day, right? So a couple of days ago um, on April 26, he posted this, right? So far, I've analyzed data from 14 countries finding 122,000 more deaths uh, in recent weeks than the usual, the usual average for those same places in the same weeks, right? So in other words, we're not looking at how many people have COVID-19 written on their death certificate, but how many more people are dying. And um, so then that makes the rates much higher. And you put, right? So this begs the question, which data should you report, right? Because these kinds of charts that he produced, right, this is the, increase in deaths compared to previously, right? Uh, so for example, Belgium, the historical average, and then there's a spike, right? But Austria um, or Portugal or Denmark are doing much better. There's no spike in deaths, right? Um, and maybe this is a lot, this is something that journalists should think about more than just the, the number of cases that have been reported to the CDC or something like that, because this shows um, that the death rate in places is a lot higher uh, than the reported deaths just from COVID-19, right? And so having a wider variety of this kind of data would help show the situation a bit, a bit, in, in a, a bit more uh, detail and a bit more, giving more different perspectives to help people understand it, right? Um, and the next aspect is, is, you know, not, again, this is not journalists' fault as much as a, a weakness um, in American news media, right? Um, there is a large lack of journalists who have medical expertise, right? Most, you know, if you work for a small newspaper, you, maybe you don't have anybody who's an expert in medical issues. If you're the New York Times or a bigger kind of newspaper, you might have a couple, but, you know, news, newspapers don't, and especially TV networks, they, you know, they don't deal with medical issues all the time, so they generally don't hire full-time people to full-time experts, right? Who are trained in medicine and also trained in journalism, right? Uh, there are people who do this, but you know, um, CNN, Sanjay Gupta is always on CNN. He must be working 16 hours a day talking about this all day long, right? Because he's one of the few people who can actually do this, right? And so we have to think of the reasons why. Why are there a lack of, of a lot of journalists with the medical expertise or, medicine, or, or, or people with medical expertise who become journalists, right? Um, one is the, 
the size of the number of journalists in newsrooms is decreasing, right? For, for various reasons, which I can't get into. There's not a lot of, you know, profit for, for, for news organizations anymore. They have to reduce the number of staff. And then they, why would they have a, so many journalists with a, with a specialization in something? Why would you have a medical journalist when maybe he, he or she will just write one story a week or something? You want to have journalists who are very general and then no matter what happens, they can cover it. Right. Um, and increasingly for this, um, especially for covering Donald Trump and things like that, they have uh, political reporters are, are becoming involved where they don't, you know, they can learn like the rest of us have kind of learned all the medical terminology and things like that. They can kind of learn about it, but that's not their training. They're, they're, they're not doctors. So it's harder for them to, to, report as accurately as someone like Sanjay Gupta would, would because he's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and again, like I said before, this is a quickly evolving situation with the novel virus and, and, the, and the experts don't always agree on things and you have some um, crazy, some medical, some people who claim that they're medical experts who say really crazy um, things that later on people debunk and people disprove. Uh, but you, they're so desperate because they don't have medical journalists who so you just invite experts on. People, oh, this person's been tweeting a lot. Let's invite them on our show uh, or, or invite, them to, <clears throat> invite them on live TV to interview them. And then we kind of realize that they don't, they, they don't really know what they're talking about, right? Uh, so that's the danger when you're just inviting random experts on. Um, instead of having your own, your own um, beat with medical journalists. Uh, so in the future, I think a lot of news outlets are going to consider hiring, uh, you know, spending more money to hire these, these kinds of journalists that we need, because especially in the next couple of years, this is, this is still going to be an issue. Uh, and we need people who have this kind of expertise uh, informing us about it. Um, <laughs> and the last thing I'll talk about is um, how journalists are, are wasting a lot of time fact-checking disingenuous sources. I gave a couple of examples before, um, but I just want to give a couple more examples that I think are quite good. Um, like this new thing where uh, Pompeo, the Secretary of State, uh, is claiming that he has enormous evidence that the virus began in, the, in the, the, the lab in Wuhan, right? And again, this is why is the story being framed from his perspective, right? Okay, he's, again, this is kind of the false balance, but it's, it's you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the report and the article, they go on to kind of debunk it. Right, they say that well, nobody has any evidence, and medical experts and the Chinese government, and you know, all these groups are saying it didn't start in a lab, right? But why waste time debunking something like that, right? Because he's not saying it because he believes it. He's saying it for political reasons because the Trump administration wants to uh, blame China for everything, right? So it's quite obvious that's why he's doing it. Yet still, CNN frames everything coming from his perspective. Um, and the same thing for Trump. This is just from today. Um, uh, speaking to reporters today, Trump said he did in fact wear a mask during a tour of the factory, the mask making factory uh, yesterday. But quote, I can't help if you didn't see me. Um, and the CNN uh, IT team is quite smart because they had, a, they actually put a picture of Trump not wearing a mask, right below a quote of him saying, you just didn't see me wearing a mask. Right. I wore one, but you didn't see me. Well, here's a picture of you actually not wearing one. Um, but again, why is it framed from Trump's denial? Right? Again, the headline should be Trump lies about wearing a mask in the factory. Right. Why, why can't the journalist do that? Again, this, this a, a too much deference to reporting what powerful people were saying. Right? In, that, in, that, um, in that tweet in the beginning of the article, there's nothing to say that Trump is lying, right? Even though he is lying about it. Right? Um, yeah, so that's the, all the examples that I have. Um, so this whole way that American journalists uh, are been covering this, it, it leads to a great environment, an environment of great uncertainty from people. We don't, the, the, the details about the medical uh, the medical details about the virus, a lot of people aren't, aren't clear about it. If social distancing is good or not, people, there's big debates about it in America now for some reason. 
um, the, the future, the, the past, people are very uncertain about all of this because of, of, in many ways, because of the way that journalists have been covering it. Of course, there's other things that contribute to it, right? Um, um, as I mentioned, there's been a, an increased media conglomeration, a lack of stable uh, funding for journalism, and this is very impactful, right? They can't hire medical journalists. They, they, have to, they have fewer journalists writing more stories. They don't have as much time to fact check. Right? It's much easier just to live stream uh, Trump's broadcast than to hire many, many more journalists to, to report in a, in a, to fact check him live, right? So the, you know, and this is the, 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 uh, the, the economic problems that journalism is dealing with recently, right? Um, the solutions to that, I don't know, you, public funding of journalists, we, we donate more money to keep news media alive. I, you know, I, there's no easy solution for this. Um, it's probably only, it'll probably, it's, it, is, it is only getting worse in the future. Many newspapers around America are shutting down. Many newsrooms are laying off, off uh, the journalists because they, the, the economic crisis has stopped advertising and then they have to go out of business, right? Uh, so this is only getting worse for the near future. Um, and the journalistic routines I've talked about previously, like, like he said, she said, and covering the press conferences live and thinking that you can ask Trump a question and he'll give you an honest answer and framing stories from the powerful people's perspective, right? Uh, this just reinforces the power they have, but even if they are not credible actors like, like Trump is, for example. Um, and of course, I don't have time to talk about this, um, but there's a lot of really good reporting that's going on. Um, and, you know, I pick examples of when it went badly, but there's many chance, many, many cases where they, they didn't frame it from Trump's perspective and did fact checking and really well before they told the story and debunked the myth before they have the lie. Right. Um, so many journalists are doing a really good job from this, but always, as always, there's room for improvement. Um, uh, but in the end, um, I like this, like to end with a quote from uh, my favorite philosopher, Jean Baudrillard, um, everything which is turned into information becomes the object of endless speculation, the, type of sol the site of total uncertainty. Um, and I think that describes our, our current situation right now very well. Um, so that's all for now. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Jesse, um, for this detailed frontline observation uh, for, for us about the U.S. media under the pandemic. There's a lot to think about and talk about, I think, um, from what you have just covered very intensively in the past 30, 40 minutes. So um, I, I don't mean to, uh, I don't need to sum up or uh, I don't want to use more time for, for my own observation. Of course, we need to give the floor actually to uh, the participants, uh, teachers and students who are here in the room. So uh, do you mind if I turn to, we turn to Q&A sections right now and take some questions? Slowly. Yes, I would love that. Yes, okay, so for those who, um, who have questions, I think you have two ways to do that, right? First, of course, you can uh, turn on your audio device and uh, just briefly state who you are and what your question is. The other way to do that is, um, of course, by typing your textual messages to the chat box if you want to, and I'll try to follow up on that uh, to keep a list, basically, of the questions being asked there. Okay, so we have two channels here uh, for, the, for the participants. Uh, if anyone has a question, please make good use of the time that we have. <laughs> so, anyone? Wow. I guess I explained everything fully, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we, it takes time. Um, you know, you cover a lot of different topics and, and you have a lot of critical views about the U.S. media. And I think all of us, for those who actually follow the news outlets, especially, you know, during this pandemic very intensively every day, uh, we have very similar feelings about, you know, there's a lot of this discussion, dissatisfaction, criticism against media, not just in the United States, but of course in China, right? 
we're the first, we would say, the epicenter of the pandemic. So I think uh, our students might have a lot more discussion, you know, about Chinese or the comparison between Chinese or the United States. Okay, so I guess we have the first question coming up in from one of the one of the IJ students. Okay, so if for those who cannot see the chat box, I'll, I'll raise the question here. So uh, it's from Annie Zhang from IJ. So he, she said, hi, Jesse, what's the differences between the UK government's daily briefing and the US briefing by Trump, according to you, your observations? Did you notice any? Yeah. I haven't, <clears throat> actually, I haven't really seen any of the UK uh, daily briefings. Um, I, because of time, because of time zone problems, right? Uh, I used to, I previously I watched um, the New York governor Cuomo, his briefings and the, uh, the Canadian prime minister Trudeau, his briefings. Um, and the, it, I used to watch the Trump ones live and then it just got too much. Uh, and then I would watch the ones from Trudeau or, or Cuomo and it was like, it, it felt amazing because like, wow, they're actually honestly answering questions and they're, and they're showing, they're showing sympathy and they're, uh, giving concrete plans and uh, apologizing if things went wrong and being a lot more uh, a lot more honest and upfront and never you know attacking journalists it was just like night and day uh, watching those kind of briefings compared to the Trump the, the Trump task force briefings um, but then you know to some extent other than the Trump part of this current of the American briefings they're quite similar in a way but whenever he got up on stage that that, that changed things quite a lot. So um, I'm not sure about the British ones, but the, I mean, they're, they're a, my impression from what I've read is they're a, they're a bit more lying and hiding things than other places are, right? Um, you know, the, the UK said that they tested more than 100,000 people in a day when actually it was only like 70,000 tests, but they had mailed out a bunch of tests. So they counted that. And they said, hey, we passed our goal. And so they're, you know, they're lying and they're trying to spin um, probably just like anybody else, like Chris Cuomo and Trudeau are trying to do it too. But it's just that the tone is very different and the amount of sympathy you get is quite different. So I think that's the biggest differences, but I'm not sure about the UK one. Yeah. Okay. Hector, I think you can uh, sing please speak up instead of uh, me reading the long questions. Can you just sum up your question? That would be easier for us. Thank you. We have a question coming from, yeah, Echo, please. Um, how about the, the question from uh, Liao Tzu Yi? Oh. Uh, okay, hi, uh, Jesse. I, I enjoyed so much of your talk and um, I don't want to discuss uh, whether or not uh, uh, I mean, media should live broadcast the the president's uh, daily daily briefing. That's another issue. But I want to discuss on whether or not reporters should ask president the president questions, because a while ago you were saying that you know knowingly that he might give some false information, disinformation, misinformation. Then probably uh, uh, reporters shouldn't be asking him questions. But now the White House briefing is, uh, you know, the, the correspondence there are to cover the president. Of course, they are covering news as well, and and the news and the, what pre the president say should not be mutually exclusive. But you know, the White House correspondence job is to cover the president, whatever he said, and he should be take responsible for what he is telling the fellow Americans, but not the reporters to scan the authenticity of what he is saying. Yeah, well, yeah, Trump, Trump should do that, but he doesn't do that. Um, and it's a bit funny that people still think that he will do that. And this one of my original points for this was going to be that people people were considering that Trump's behavior uh, might change completely because of this. Um, and every time he's he 
said he changed his, he read a, a nice speech or he seemed to show a little sympathy. The journalists would get very excited and say, wow, he changed now. But eventually it, it wouldn't, he would go back to the, to the old ways of doing it. Um, it's, I think it's kind of a trap. Right, and Trump has been doing this for a very long time for trapping journalists because they he knows that he has this power that whenever he speaks, people will just rush over and listen to what he's saying. Right, it's part of his his narcissism and and his you know is wanting to get all of this attention. So he knows that he can do that in order to to trap journalists even, and he will use it just to uh, for to help him get reelected or to help his ego or something like that instead of giving information. So the, you know, it's this catch 22, right? The, he's important. He's going to say something, but he's going to lie and spin, but we have to cover what he says, even though he's not going to tell us the truth. Right. Which is why like a lot of the people I mentioned were saying that, well, cover it, but don't cover it live. Right. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we have more questions coming up. So if you don't mind, can I relay one of the questions from Liao, Liao Ziyi? Okay, so basically the question is, why don't you think the journalists would play a bigger role or let's say that have a bigger voice, stronger voice in terms of, you know, countering those non-facts and misinformation, right? That given by this, uh, you know, uh, politicians and supposedly authoritative sources that journalists rely on, right, for our livelihood, indeed, in terms of reporting the news. Why don't you think the American journalists or media in general, as you said, the mainstream media, wanted to speak a little bit louder with their own voice in terms of, you know, this political struggles in daily reporting or even, of course, more so under the pandemic? Well, I think they, they do talk a lot about it, but it's it's in more like analytic pieces or opinion pieces or when they get called on CNN or MSNBC to discuss it live or something like that. Um, but they, they still want to maintain the credibility um, so they can't speak as a as a as a journalist about it in that way if they do it a bit more personally or they they do it as an analysis or something like that then they can kind of dig a bit deeper into uh, it i mean if you're you know if you're academic like me or you're a commentator you can say well trump is doing this because he's narcissistic or a sociopathic but you if you're a mainstream journalist you obviously you can't say that Right. Even if you tweet it, you could get in trouble. So trying to get a bit deeper in explaining it is, is, you know, is something that journalists have been struggling with, and it's and it's very. They've decided that they don't want to do it, if in the normal, in the normal like breaking news journalistic style. They figured this is something that we keep for opinion pieces and analysis because we don't want to appear to be that biased against Trump. So yeah. So do you think it's still a problem, like the bottom line of objectivity or professionalism that the journalists and our, also our journalist students have been trained, you know, in, in, in journalism schools that you, you cannot, right? You need to suppress your subjective voice and whatever you call it, bias, etc. So you still have to, you know, very easily for many fall into this, you said, he said and she said model of kind of lazy reporting do you think it's an avoidable trend then well that because it's it's hard to avoid that because that's what you if you want to be a professional journalist then that's what you have to do so you you risk losing everything if you don't do that so why would people risk risk doing that even in the face of, of a situation like this right if they do it properly even if it's misleading people nobody Nobody is, will get fired for balancing a story, right? So the, the, I basically, I think there's no benefit professionally for them doing it. Uh, and a lot of them think that is, it's, it's necessary to do that, maybe. Um, if they didn't, they wouldn't be working for C, CNN or MSNBC, would they? Okay. So, well, let's, let's, let's carry that on to the next um, 
next question from from the audience. Okay, so Kate uh, from the audience asked that you know uh, she said I believe some press would like to exaggerate the fact in order to have some attention from the audiences. So how should journalists balance this percentage between truth and public preference? Do you think that the yeah? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, again, that's that's a big issue because. Um, you know, this is a trend that people have noticed a lot over the last 10, 15 years that there are a lot more of clickbaity kind of headlines, even from uh, CNN. I've given many examples in class of this where there's a, a, I guess you call it a leading headline where it's like, you won't believe what Trump said yesterday. And you go, oh, click, right? The journalists are using this or being pressured to do this from their organizations because their organizations want to, want, their news organizations want to make money and then make money by clicking on stories. And, you know, that's, that's fair enough. That's how it works nowadays. Um, and I'm sure that's perfectly fine for, for sports or for entertainment news or, you know, gardening news or things like that. It's like, oh, you won't imagine the, 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 this great new food that everybody's eating. Okay, that's fine, but like for, you know, news about a pandemic, it's not really that cool. It's not really appropriate to exaggerate. And I think a lot of journalists um, and the editors or the, the, the social media editors have gotten into this kind of a habit of, you know, a lot of the examples I gave of headlines, it's, that's more from their habit of reporting in that way than of reporting in this, like, like Kate says, this kind of exaggerated way. Um, so they really need to, to consider, you know, that doing this exaggerated clickbaity kind of thing is for certain kinds of news, but not for health news and not for pandemic epidemic news. That's very inappropriate to use it in that context. Um, but like I said, I think they just get in the habit of doing it and it's hard to break and you know, they still want to make money and they still want to get clicks. So it's hard to, to change that kind of a habit. You know, that's what I would say. Yeah. So can we say that in a way covering Trump is also, you know, part of this uh, sensationalism that has been <laughs> included into the economic interests, some of the media institutions, yeah. right? Have been like I said, like maybe that's why they want to cover his press conference live because he'll, he'll say something extreme and then they, wow, now he said something really extreme. Now we have all these stories that we can write about from what Trump said. And especially if he says something very misleading, then the journalist will know, well, it's great. Now I can write three or four stories just on this really insane thing Trump said just now. So, you know, um, and then they've written more stories. They've exposed the lies of a powerful person. And, you know, it's a win-win situation for everybody uh, from their perspective. Right. Um, but again, it's like Kate said, it's, ex it's a bit too exaggerated in a way. Okay. So, sorry, may I, um, it's a second question from someone who already asked a question. And if you don't mind, can I insert my question at this point? Um, so aside from this economic interest that, you know, as you mentioned that the US media have been, right? In terms of conglomeration, slashing jobs and funding for them. So there's a lack of professional voice, especially in health and then uh, medical, right? medical journalism, et cetera. Um, would, what would you say that if someone said, well, yeah, despite all that, if our president said something crazy, it's not just a talk, right? I mean, he's still the president of the most powerful state in the world. And what he thinks, however crazy it is, what he thinks has some real consequences economically, politically, to people who are not just living in this country, but people from across this world. So, you know, aside from all this economic interest, entertainment values, et cetera, don't you think that there's still something there that, um, that keeps the journalists, you know, this ongoing um, excessive differences, coverage of what he said on a daily basis? Don't you think it's still some kind of, they're more than that, um, if that makes sense, if it's coming from the president of the United States, then probably we should care about, you know, what he thinks because it has consequences. Yeah, it, but the thing is, it only has consequences if you amplify it and you legitimate what he's saying. 
that's the only way that it has any impact or any consequence on anything. If, if you know, the journalists were, were, were talking about it on, on, on Twitter, for example, what if nobody, what if no journalist came to the press conference or the task force? Or if every journalist came, but they didn't ask Trump a single question. And people were, 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 were touting that as an idea. And I thought that's, that's never going to happen. You're never going to find a journalist and the president in the same room and they're not going to ask him some question. That's just antithetical to, how, to what it is to be a journalist, right? Why would you give up that, that opportunity? That's what you've been taught from, you know, <laughs> from undergraduate to you know, being socialized on the job and talking with your colleagues. That's the, you know, many journalists would dream about being able to interview the president and ask him a question. So, th so this, this, this ingrained part of, of the ideology of journalism, I believe that makes it very difficult to kind of break away from this, this kind of a habit. Um, and like I said, Trump knows this and he can, he can trap people into doing that in a way. And, um, it, it will take a lot of bravery and a lot of strength for, for journalists to say, well, you know, the, the truth is more important. Saving lives is more important than just amplifying uh, what this unreliable source says. And just because somebody is powerful, it doesn't mean everything they say is automatically worth amplifying, right? That's the only reason that powerful people have power is because we automatically ampl amplify all the things that they say. So journalists are, are, part of, are part of doing that, right? And they have to think a bit more about that and, and recognize that. Hello, yeah, Rachel. Yeah, I, I, I might China. ask a question. Uh, yeah, Jesse, uh, yeah, I, I'm not a journalist. Uh, this is not my field, but uh, I just uh, a layman or outside uh, watching uh, the news from American, particularly from Donald Trump, it seems quite amusing. You also report uh, Donald Trump, it, it seems a lot, a lot of sensation news, a lot of sensation news uh, almost every day. Uh, and also from the big uh, background, it seems he's one person to fighting with the whole media world fighting with the all journalists, one person. And then even every day is some sensation news, uh, some kicking and, and then nasty, whatever. But uh, give me the feeling, he seems still getting uh, more uh, popularity. It seems use his own uh, twist uh, and then finding the whole media world, it seems to me he's still uh, doing quite well. So what you comment on that, that is first, what you all comment, since your media, journalism media, it seems losing this world with one person uh, who just used a twist, fighting with your guy, even the president briefing, uh, a lot wrong uh, speaking, uh, uh, Inaccurate, he's still doing quite well. That's, that's one question, puzzle, really puzzle me. You might comment on that. Second question, okay, more real one. So after, okay, from your in, uh, presentation or your show, ah, a lot, a lot problem, authentic, uh, and then a lot mis uh, uh, unbalanced uh, and dishonesty, a lot, a lot of things are now going on. And then, okay, now I would like to uh, ask, from your media uh, point to judge, how about the outcome, his image uh, about this election, the campaign, the president campaign. So what do you feel? Uh, he's still uh, doing well, still be elected, or now he's just uh, another nasty guy, uh, like uh, we call it, uh, in Chinese, he's still a winner. Okay, you call me on two questions. Mm. Yeah, well, um, it's, <clears throat> it's probably because of things that I, that I didn't talk about today about, about Fox News and, and 
all the other media that that support and amplify what, what Trump is saying. Um, and, you know, many the you know, they say that the, the kind of logic in politics is Trump has a has a base and he can't go below that base because they they already invested so much in supporting Trump that no matter what he does, even if he, you know, mishandles a pandemic that kills hundreds of thousands of people, they'll still say, well, it's Obama's fault, it's China's fault, though, because you have this echo chamber of Fox News and, and Trump and Trump's people and uh, the conservative talk radio and this whole kind of media ecosystem that will help that will help amplify Trump's Trump's message, which is very effective to fight against the criticism of him. Um, so he's and he's been relying on that even since before he was elected, right? To to help maintain it. So you could say he's doing well with his base, um, but for everybody else in the middle, it, it's would be very it'll be very interesting to see over the next couple of of months uh, how the public perception about it is changing. Um, because right now it's we're still kind of in the middle of it, and like any situation where there's a hurricane or a disaster or a war, right? There's a lot of people who are who are very who don't really want to criticize the president, right? Um, in in the Iraq War, many journalists had to quit because they criticized how how uh, George Bush was doing the Iraq War, um, and and so there's a lot of you know fear about being too critical about Trump um, and that will probably disappear in the next several months but it's it, you know it's hard to say uh, unfortunately it will rely on on um, the virus continuing to impact people in America and it will unfortunately involve more people uh, getting sick and dying and that's not you know and but again, he'll be able to explain that out in some way and deflect blame like he's always done, and and to keep to keep that base right. But what will happen with the people in the middle? That'll be very interesting to see, right? Okay, Thank and, you. and a lot of it depends on how the journalists if journalists will will kind of rethink how they're covering it and maybe change uh, change in the future. That could that could be a really big impact on it. But we you know we can't expect that from Fox News and those kind of organizations. Okay, how about the outcome? You can foretell uh, the outcome from your media, uh, journalism viewpoint, the president campaign. So far, for he's doing elect. well or, or, or something uh, definitely wrong, damaging uh, his yeah. credibility. Yeah, I mean, for the election right now, the, uh, it's, the election is kind of on a hold mm. right now. The people are kind of testing out campaign messages but it's i, I don't i can't I, we don't really know enough about uh, about it to say anything either way right now um okay okay thank you see, yeah. thank you thank you <laughs> yes okay we have one new question from charlie lim uh who asked you to do a little bit of historical comparison between how the media did under the pandemic between SARS and right now how do you compare this media environment you know 17 years ago as opposed to now mm, I'm not I'm not sure how much I can say about that I, w I wasn't uh, I wasn't really paying attention that much to the media to the media escape back 17 something years ago so I'm not really sure uh, what were I you can in say China 17 years ago Jesse no in SARS I was still in in San Francisco um, I remember walking around in, in Chinatown and seeing Chinese people wearing masks, which I thought was quite odd. Um, and now I think that's odd if I don't <laughs> see somebody wearing a mask. So, um, but I mean, it, obviously there are the changes in, in having a lot more social media, um, but also there's the changes in the in the, um, the the virus and how it spreads, and it's a lot more uh, a lot more invasive than SARS is. So I think that's kind of the biggest the biggest difference is the disease itself. Um, and for the United States, at least, it's probably a bit more uh, the increased polarization in, in, in politics and media. Political polarization has increased a lot. So, um, but it didn't really imp impact America that much. So I can't, I'm not sure what I can say about that. Uh, do you have any idea? Does anybody Maybe else know? Yeah. Does anybody else has more experience on that? 
comparing, you know, what happened 17 years ago under SARS and, and the current media coverage under the COVID-19. Could any panelists perhaps say one thing or two, if you want to? Yeah, Elga, you can speak something up on that, Elga. Because the Hong yeah. Kong and Beijing. Uh. Yeah, Elga, want to say something? Uh, your turn, not turn on your microphone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as um, as uh, Jesse said a while ago, that uh, uh, SARS and uh, the COVID nineteen are not quite comparable because uh, uh, for the SARS it only affected uh, mostly two places. One is Hong Kong and Beijing, and not even the whole China. Mainly, um, of course, Guangdong as well. But uh, for the rest of the country, uh, those are not much, those were not much uh, affected, and then. Uh, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what, what how it happened, uh, how it was covered in the U.S. and the rest of the world, but I, I don't think there were much uh, coverage of it. Uh, except, well, I mean, coverage on what happened in China, uh, yes, but not uh, on on the local uh, communities because uh, the virus uh, did not went, did not go that far in the first place. In the second place, is that. Um, uh, the SARS lasted for compar a, a, a relatively a short period of time, uh, as uh, not uh, I mean uh, uh, the the COVID nineteen has been here for uh, almost half a year now, and um, from one place first wave in China and the second wave in the rest of the world, Europe, and US as well. Yeah. So it's not quite comparable. And um, and of course, uh, in terms of the, the death tolls, um, well, it's uh, much much uh, more now than in the SARS. So it's um, it's well, I was, in a sense. Yeah. If I could say something, um, I, I was just thinking how in, a, in the the similarities are are a bit more interesting. I think um, because. You know, journalists, they, they learn how to frame events by how events were framed previously, right? So when, when the COVID 19s first started to break out, the first thing that American and many Western journalists were thinking about is SARS. And the, all the early reports were framed from the perspective of, of what happened when, with SARS and saying, well, is there going to be a cover up, right? Maybe with social media now that the information will flow more freely or something like that. And they had the same kind of framing as they did previously. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that I think is kind of, is kind of interesting. Right? Yes, uh, on, on um, uh, comparison, like uh, in the first wave in the, in the US, I think most of the people were uh, have the mindset that you know it has nothing to do with the U.S. or the rest of the world, except China. If they frame the news mm -hmm. as what it was as SARS, so including the whole way of how they treat it. Uh, I mean, the 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 government was uh, there to uh, think of uh, policies how to contain it or so, but they, they are not. They're not paying much uh, or enough attention on it uh, because they frame it differently. Yeah. And I think it'd be interesting. Uh, I probably don't have the expertise to do it, but I'm, I'm certain that, um, and I might research this later on, to compare how the media frames these kind of pandemics when they break out, depending on where it, it breaks out. So if it's, the, you know, the swine flu, which came from, you know, United States or Ebola, which came from here, or and when H one, you know, it, it, comparing how, you know, you know the the political, the economic, the the development of a country and a disease breaks out there, how that 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 affects how journalists frame it a lot more than than many other things, right? Um, yeah, so it, it's it's 
this unfair kind of, you know, the, the stereotypes that journalists have about different countries. And like I said, just this is the way that they always cover this kind of story. So when it happens again, they cover it in the same way. Right. If it's a if it's a flood in New Orleans, it's like once in a lifetime thing and who knows. But if it's a, a flood in, in, in Bangladesh, it's like, well, that's a normal thing. And they, the journalists don't think it's that special. Right. So if it's a disease breaking out in China, they go, oh, just like SARS. Right. But, it, you know, so it, it's this that that tradition, that habit that journalists have of framing certain things in certain ways uh, because they come from certain regions. So, yeah. Okay. okay, I think we have uh, perhaps one more question coming up in the line. So uh, from Iris, uh, who wanted to ask, should journalists in both US and China keep comparing to each other and judging on the government action? Because it may make their audiences dislike each other and some useful medical advices will be uh, perhaps ignored. So what should journalists report the situation better in other countries you think yeah i mean that's 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 exactly what i was thinking about like when um um when when covid19 was breaking out here um and the the journal obviously journalists were paying attention and they were covering the story uh about what was happening in china but they kind of did it like like you said like from something that's happening in a foreign country and this is what China is doing about it. And then when it happens in America, suddenly they're like, what do we do? How, <laughs> what, what, how do we report on this? Should people wear masks or should they not wear masks? How close can you be? Does it, does it spread? Should you, if you're, you know, they, somehow the journalists just had amnesia completely about what they were covering about China or they didn't think, somehow they didn't think it applied to covering uh, United States. Um, so it, it was quite bizarre. Um, so again, maybe it, it's like, you know, it's this, this stereotype or this, well, that's something that happens in a foreign country that can't happen here. This kind of perspective that journalists might have where they, they discount all of the stuff that, you know, people in China have been doing. And, and, you know, so then I see stories about it, and about wearing masks and it drove me crazy. I said, will masks protect you from it? And I think, well, that's what we've been doing. And I mean, I've been here since, since it happened and that's what we've been doing every day to help protect ourselves and protect other people. And then the news stories were like, oh, it's a cultural thing. East Asians will wear masks, but Americans won't wear masks. And, and it, it's just very odd. So I, there do, needs to be a bit more of, of a feeling that like everybody is human and diseases like this affect everybody in the, in the same way. And, you know, China has a different political system than the United States, but it doesn't mean that you can't learn from it and, and you know, and, and see things that other places are doing and follow from it, right? Um, so I think that would be a good idea for, for the journalists to talk to each other a bit more um, instead of viewing each other as, as enemies or as adversaries or something like that. Um, and yeah, and I agree, it could have some effect on the, on the audience. Right. And this is what this is a dangerous thing, like the couple of examples I gave of people trying to stir up, um, stir up negative emotions about China. Um, and just just today, just before we started, there was um, the, the I think the um, the, the spokeswoman for the foreign the spokesperson, I'm not sure who from the Chinese foreign ministry, uh, they were asked a question by the BBC and she was he or she, I forget, sorry, <laughs> gave a very, a very nice response and saying, well, we shouldn't be, you know, uh, blaming other people. We should be learning from other people about what to do and what happened and how to prevent this in the future and working together. Um, and that's not a message that we're getting from, from the Trump administration. Um, so journalists have to, you know, think a bit harder about which kind of perspective they were going to be using to report about things in the future, especially for, uh, China America relationship. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that um, we are actually more connected globally to each other than we are culturally and even more so ideologically, judging by the right, uh, the journalism, right, the performance of journalism across countries. Um, so if we have more time, would you be able to comment on one more question? 
regarding especially uh, journalism education, right? As the, you know, the problems that you can see from the journalists, how they did it in this pandemic yeah. in different countries. So what kind of, you think, um, <laughs> courses that, or what kind of, you know, uh, education that, that we should be incorporating into um, journalism education, not just in China, of course, but more so perhaps across the world. So what do you think as a teacher then? Um, I, I think, <clears throat> I mean, I think now would be a very good time to start contemplating about creating, uh, about recruiting medical people with medical knowledge or people with medical degrees to, uh, to transfer into maybe postgraduate programs for journalism. Um, or the other way around for medical uh, medical schools to take journalist students and you know to focus a lot more on on medical communication uh, kind of education for professionals um, i I would like to you know to look and see if there is a actual degree that 's about medical journalism right there 's sports journalism and all these kinds of you know crisis communication or something like that but um, you know it, it like I said, we need to have more people who are specialized in, in this. Uh, and, you know, you, you can't, obviously you can't, it helps if you have a medical degree and, and deep, you know, scientific knowledge about medicine and journalism to help report on that. But even just for, for just everyday kind of journalists, right, having a lot more education uh, about how to understand it would be more helpful. But obviously having more full-time people would be a lot more uh, a lot more, um, a lot more positive, right? But um, yeah, so focusing more on, on health communication, you know, and, and, and extending that to being about journalism and more cooperation between the, the, the public health and, the, and the, the journalism parts of the universities, I think would be something that many people will probably pursue in the near future, um, especially considering this. Um, and hopefully that will help um, that will help in the future because this is not going to be the last time we have a global pandemic unfortunately right like you said it's great that we're all connected with each other uh, with social media and with with news and learning about learning about information and spreading information but that is also the you know the globalization is also the reason why the pandemic was able to spread so quickly so it's a double-edged sword, right? So we have to, you know, plan for both contingencies in the future, and yeah, education for journalism, journalists, and and medical health, uh, public health people is very important for that. I agree. So first, spend ten years in medical school, right, and to be qualified to be a doctor in the hospital, good, and then good. two more years or four more years in yeah. journalism school for the yeah. MA or undergraduate degree. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or, you know, an entire health communication degree or something, but one that's more geared towards um, journalism. Um, uh, at least to give you the tools to, to understand all of these concepts. I've seen many journalists who, who've been living in this world and studying coronavirus stuff for such a long time, but they still, you know, don't have the, the, the vocabulary to really understand. Um, like, for, for instance, many, uh, the Lancet and many medical journals are publishing papers and they're uh, they have pre-publication papers and journalists. A lot of them are really misinterpreting what the what the studies say because of the language difference and and not having the medical scientific mind to really be able to understand it. Um, where even you know where you would need medical experts to really explain that to you in, in more detail. Um, and yeah, so that's we we need both minds in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a new question from James Young. Um, so, Jesse, what kind of responsibilities are journalists from both China and the U.S. supposed to take during such pandemic time? Can we do better? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think, and a lot of news organizations have done this, where um, like New York Times or uh, other places where they remove the paywall for the, the content about coronavirus. Uh, which is, you know, um, 
they they often do that during disasters or something like that, right? So that you don't have to have a subscription and you get all the up to date information that they're they're doing um, about about that and um, you know not thinking about the bottom line, not thinking about making a profit and and getting hits and, and things like that. You know you 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 need to do that, but do that in other times. This is not the this is not the place. Uh, to focus on your ratings, right? This is what Trump is talking about all the time about his ratings and his ratings are so wonderful. And it's like, and, and you know, journalists aren't saying that, but the way a lot of people are reporting on it, it seems more like a, you know, being a bit, uh, you know, not that they're not taking it seriously, but taking it a lot more seriously than, than they are. Um, and, yeah, and just, I don't know, I don't, it's hard to say because, the, like I said, the, without having a lot of, uh, without having a lot of uh, medical knowledge, it becomes very difficult for journalists to dig much deeper, right? That's why, like, the example I gave of the, the journalists who are using big data, and they can get all these data sets of, of mortality rates and things like that and create something from that. But you need to have some kind of uh, basis of knowledge in, in something else before you can help uh, before you can use that to help create really good journalism. Yeah. Yes, but um, I agree, but it's not just about professionalism, right? Since we have seen the problems with professionalism in especially associated with journalism, it's also about the changing role. I guess the question has to do with the changing role of journalism as well. Mm -hmm. When the politicians are speaking directly to the general public, right? Right which the conversation used to be mediated by professional journalists. Supposedly, yeah. we are going to make it more rational. We're going to make it, make the public discussion, right? More informed, rational, et cetera, to grow democracy. But right now, the situation, of course, has been almost completely overhauled because of the direct communication, almost direct communication between this um, public figures and their fan base or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. political base. So how do you see really in the future, what kind of role that journalism should play without this guarantee, right? The role guarantee as a mediator in between. Right, so like, like you know, people were saying, even if Trump stopped doing the coronavirus task force uh, news press conferences, he would still be tweeting out all of this misinformation all the time. And while had broadcasting it live on TV, like I said, broadcasting it live amplifies the message so much, um, but he would still be tweeting about it. And then you have to think, are you just gonna retweet what Trump said and then comment like, wow, would he, so he's, going really, he's getting really crazy today. Like, why is he tweeting this at 5 a.m.? Like, you, you know, you can, it, don't, again, like I said, don't amplify it, don't, you know, if he's tweeting, it's the same thing. You have to fact check it. You can't, re you can't just repeat it. You can't just retweet it or just make a news story just out of the fact that he tweeted something. Uh, because then you're amplifying it and you're spreading it to audiences that maybe don't follow Trump on Twitter and audiences that don't follow people on, on their preferred uh, news network, right? So that's a, you know, that's a, and again, that's a big challenge for them, like we were talking about before, because the president says something, he, it's almost irresponsible. It's almost unprofessional not to cover it. But at the same time, it's very irresponsible to cover it when it can, it can cost people lives. Right. Yeah. It's okay. Like, for example, it's newsworthy to say, uh, you know, like Trump said, everybody should wear masks, but I'm not going to wear a mask. And okay that's notable but i don't know if that should be the headline the headline should be wear masks and then maybe the 10th paragraph you can say trump for some strange reason said that he wasn't going to wear a mask but that shouldn't be like the thing that leads the story that's not the message that we should get from that the message that people should get should be wear a mask and that's what the the, the journalist should be amplifying instead of you know, taking a cheap shot at Trump for doing something stupid, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think you're calling for a more progressive, in my understanding, right? More progressive role that media should play, perhaps, in this intensified conversation yeah. between the public and uh, public figures. 
So um, if we have five more minutes, I'm, I'm afraid we don't. We have probably two or three more minutes more. I wonder if anyone who has not yet been able to ask a question in the past an hour and a half uh, with Jesse, our speaker tonight on news media, especially American news media under the pandemic, you can uh, take this opportunity to ask this one more question, please. Oh, well, if I could just say um, the, uh, the, uh, the person who asked the question previously, Iris said that, um, that sh she's studying uh, science okay. communication. Um, and I think it's an interesting comment. Um, science communication is more how to communicate science with governments and how to write, write news releases, right? Mm -hmm. But again, not so much about t journalism in science and health education and health communication, right? So I think that's, that's an interesting um, perspective from that. Mm -hmm. Because perhaps it's easier to do it that way than the yeah. other way around. Yeah, right? but you, you, can, you can communicate all the science you want to, to, to someone like Trump and he's it's not gonna have any effect on it. So you, you, you communicate the science effectively to the public uh, through journalism or through um, something like that. That's probably a better way of doing it. And then you can't, you can't, we can't always rely on politicians. Yes, of course. So if I may, can I conclude this uh, by asking you one more question, very quick question. Um, do you have any good or better sources, news sources to recommend, you know, who, who did better than the, you know, US mainstream media? Do you notice something that we can share perhaps to get better quality news? People always ask journalism professors that, what should I really, what is the best place I should really yeah. read, right? Uh, and the only thing I can say is it's not what you read it, it's how you read it. You cannot r rely on, the, like I said, you cannot really rely on these clickbait headlines, even from CNN, right? You, you have to go in and read the articles and, and really see what they're saying. You have to follow uh, many different people. And I think a lot of people are doing this nowadays where you mm -hmm. follow a lot of people uh, and look at a lot of different news about it. But then again, that leads to what other people have talked about the infodemic and too much information and being too confusing. Um, so it's, you know, I don't really have a good answer for that. There's not one news organization you can watch that does it better than other ones. They all do it well in some ways and they all have shortcomings in other ways and it's it's you know but you did imply that the bbc or al jazeera perhaps did a little bit better at some point did you yeah they a, a lot of news organizations they did they they were following those rules more of not repeating myths and not repeating lies and instead leading by challenging it right so uh, you know i think the british media did a, a bit better job from that um but again, if you're not in England and you want to follow news about what's happening where you are, you know, you have to rely on American media and have all the, the, the shortcomings that we've talked about. So, Did you follow any um, Chinese media? Can I ask? Yeah, I have. I follow them on, on various social media. Uh, what, what kind of? It's the English language Chinese media, so it's, it's a bit different uh, than I uh, think. Which one? Which ones? Um, Global Times and China Daily, and the the the, um, the the editor of Global Times has very a very funny Twitter <laughs> account. Very it's a who right? Who Xi Jinping? Yeah, very very aggressive, but you know, um, very very much more truthful than than um, definitely a lot more truthful than what Trump is saying a lot of the time. So it kind of makes you, <laughs> yeah. What about CGTN? Yeah. Um, not not as much. Um, I don't know. It's been so much. It's, I've been reading so much news over the last five yeah. months, and especially the last several years. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to think about it. But um, I mean, the foreign media covered the outbreak in, in China fairly well. Um, but also, I was here, and it was a lot more a word of mouth and. and people communicating with each other 
um, and, or people translating things from Chinese into English for me, that, that is how I learned about it more in China, but, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, uh, for tonight. I think uh, we benefit so much for, from you and your work lately about news media, especially under the pandemic. Um, even though it's from the United States, I think it's good you know, for us to focus on right transnational sources, especially for our own students. So I'm afraid that we need to stop here uh, for tonight, for this wonderful talk given by my colleague here at UIC, uh, Jesse Brana, Owen Brunnerman. So uh, for those who, uh, thank you for everyone for coming uh, from this country or from the outside. I believe there are some former students, I believe, graduates from UIC and came back and joined our lecture, which is great. And indeed, this is perhaps one of the benefits, very few benefits that we had uh, yeah. teaching online. Am I right? That we have people coming from the past or you know, from across the country or outside to join us in a conversation. So thank you so much all for joining, especially our colleagues and uh, the other panelists who join us tonight. So this is the end of our um, lecture and conversation. Uh, thank you again. And uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank can, you, can, Jesse. Yeah, and thank you, Jesse. Everybody, Elga, and then everybody. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you very much Thanks. for- yeah, Thank you, well done, well done, okay. Goodbye. Right. Goodbye. Good night. Uh, goodbye. Good night. Good night.